Homage to the blessed noble and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed noble and perfect enlightened one. Namo Sadanto Suchedoye Ulahudi Samya O Sampatoshi. Namo Sadanto Suchedoye Alahadi Samya O Sampatoshi. Mushang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa. Bai Chien Wan Jie Nan Sao Yu. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered, even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, Good afternoon today and good evening. Today is Sunday, July 25th here in the Gold Coast of Queensland, Australia. We are well into Leo time and it is Saturday, July 24th in California where some of you are listening in. Uh, welcome to all the friends who are joining from around the world, wherever you are. And my name is Hung Shur. I'm happy to be with you today. Um, we are going to be looking into the Flower Garland Sutras 10 Stages chapter, looking into the very end of the 10 stages, the, the verse portion of the 10th stage, the stage of the Dharma cloud, IUB. And I want to also express my gratitude to the team of volunteers who are making this possible, uh, both here in Australia, uh, helping putting me online and also translating into Chinese, and the team in California who are putting this uh, Zoom call out onto YouTube and further helping translate into Vietnamese. So what a lot of hands and hearts coming together to make this possible so that we can uh, uh, explore the wonders of the Flower Garland Sutra, the Avatamsaka. Rare that people care enough to make this sutra come alive. Um, this was our founder, Shang Xuan Xia Hua, Lao Ha Shang, Master Xuan Hua's vow. And uh, he told us over a period of nine years how important the Flower Garland Sutra was. So uh, we're just doing it once a week. He did it every night for nine years. So <coughs> this is uh, a joy to be able to explore it and uh, there's truly magic in uh, the in the process of opening these texts and just uh, as they say rufa doing it according to dharma and asking the buddhas and bodhisattvas to uh, to bless us and to uh, help us guide our steps through this this text and you never know what's going to pop up uh, so all we have to do is be sincere open our hearts and uh, Use a mind of kindness and an attitude of, of uh, they say in Chinese, the term is tianzhen wuxie, true like nature, naturally true and not 
shit, not leave it, not cook it, right? So the same attitude that, that kids bring to something new and fresh and special, something that, that is wonderful, you know, and keeps, keeps uh, showing us new things. That's the attitude and the sutra just opens up and we realize that this consciousness that we, the narrow cave of consciousness that limits us to language and thought and to ideology and to uh, dogma. This is, is a choice we make, which limits us so totally from all of the wonder that is happening right this minute, all the trillions of beings inside our bodies that are making us, keeping us alive and, and how all of us together on this planet are moving our spaceship earth through, through the sky. And uh, just the, uh, the challenges and the glories of that is, is what's found in the Flower Garland Sutra. So here's our text today. Um, we're gonna come back to page 96. And I might point out that there's only one more page in this text to go before we're done. So back up to the top where we're going to invoke spiritual presence. And I'm pleased today to do so with the accompaniment of a 110 year old banjo, an elder statesman banjo, A.A. Farland, uh, made in the East Coast back in maybe 1910. And, uh, singing to this day, helping us invoke the flower garland assembly of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. So let's do that now. It's got some beautiful trim on it, the kind of handwork done back in 1900s, early last century. Back to page 94. We, uh, for people who don't know Flower Garland Sutra, is about the bodhisattva path people who want to do that who want to walk the bodhisattva path who want to imitate the ways of great bodhisattvas and in the future at some point ideally transform the self into the selflessness of the bodhisattva himself herself and uh, the 10 stages chapter gives us a graduated sequence how to do that yourself how to walk that path step by step by step and 
the our, our constant challenge is to remember that this is about human beings. This is about people. Bodhisattva awakened human, awakened being. Um, it never leaves the human, the realm of human experience, but it's a realm of human experience that few of us experience, few of us actually undergo because it requires dedication and um, a course of behavior with discipline along the, the cookie cutter of the Dharma, right? Uh, fa in Chinese as a verb, Dharma can also mean to imitate. To fa somebody is to imitate them, to put yourself in their shoes, in their clothes, in their words, in their thoughts, in their actions, until you come out of that M-O-U-L-D, <coughs> mold, if you spell it the British way, M-O-L-D, think of a cookie cutter going down on dough and coming up with a Christmas tree, Christmas cookie, or a snowman, or a star, right? Do you celebrate Christmas? So what, what else do we use for molds? Um, it comes out, oh, I know, I know. There's something that I discovered with Vietnamese cuisine. Uh, Vietnamese vegetarian cuisine has this wonderful custom of creating these incredibly intricate molds for jello. And it's agar jello. It's not cows, you know, horses hoofs, cows hoofs jello. You all know that jello gelatin is not vegetarian, right? Sorry to tell you that. It comes from the hoofs of animals. Agar, the seaweed, is the way the Vietnamese vegetarian cuisine does it, is made from, from seaweed. And they, they make these incredibly carved out, uh, intricate uh, landscapes on a, a plate that is, the bottom of it is all carved. So you pour in the agar and it, it uh, I don't know, they chill it, but it, it molds. And then you flip it over and take it off and the mold is, Got this picture of an ocean undersea landscape with fish and and seaweed and and beautiful light or it's a lotus garden or it's a mountain just amazing uh vietnamese jello molds that are uh just spectacular the way they're they're so intricate but the dharma and the bodhisattva path is the same way in that it's uh taking the, the agar the the seaweed jelly is you is your body, your mind, your nature, your life. And when you put the mold of the Dharma over it, what comes out is this incredibly intricate, perfect functioning being called a Bodhisattva. Right? And it goes step by step by step. And each stage, each one of these grounds is different than the previous one and higher and more challenging and more difficult and more sublime when you go through the process. So, don't you know that in that, pro I'm, I'm riffing before we get to our first verse here, but uh, I'm, I'm introducing what we're looking at here. The, um, the process of matching that mold, of putting yourself into that form so that you really do think, speak, and act, body, mouth, and mind the way bodhisattvas do, is an uncomfortable process because you have to take on that form and you have to reduce where you're in excess and you slop over the form too much you have to fill in where you're insufficient and come up with in your heart of courage and energy the the what's needed the deficiency in order to match that mold perfectly i have a uh, some friends who are musicians who say uh that Young people um, don't seem to be willing to learn to put in the effort to read music anymore. That uh, uh, they arrive at the music lesson without even being able to count, without even being able to to read. And when you to read a musical score, if it's violin, it's a single staff. If it's drums, if it's piano, it's double staff. You know, right hand, left hand, and. You have to be willing to put down your, your entertainment device, right? Your communications, your social media device long enough 
to read notes if you're ever going to launch into a career as a musician. And uh, it's, it's a little bit painful. You have to, the child has to love their mother or their teacher enough to, to be willing to part with the, the trance of social media, right? TikTok and put it down and then make the effort required to learn music if you're ever going to become a musician. So the same way, when we cultivate the Dharma, we have to be willing to put in the hours of bowing, put in the hours of sitting, put in the hours of service, of being kind to people and helping. Uh, then, then we can match that mold and the Bodhisattva path can arise. That's the process. And it's been that way forever. And the 10 stages chapter is how to, is how to do it. It's telling us how to do it. Here's the instructions. This is an instruction manual. At the same time, it's an exhortation. And it's also, as we've been learning, we learned about the anointing on the crown and the 10th stage. We learned about how lotus flowers arise. We learned about uh, how lights come from the Bodhisattva and go into the Buddha and come out of the Buddha and go into the Bodhisattva. And we learned about uh, uh, dragons, my goodness, uh, and oceans, because this is the Dharma cloud stage, Fa Yun Di. And we're today, we're learning about something special, mountains. We're in the verses that repeat the prose and sacred mountains pop up in the 10th stage, out of the blue, for some reason, Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva is now, last week he concluded, right? He said, that's it, this is the summary. This week he says, yep, one more time. Yes, famous hits. Like the first ground, we have the mountain Himalaya. And like the second ground, we have the mountain Namindara, right? So it's like, okay, let's learn about sacred mountains. Here we go. This is the conclusion that's for last week, from last week. And uh, because it's verses, we're going to chant it. Is everybody ready to join me here? Here we go. Chu tsu do zo san jie wang. Chu tsu do zo san jie wang. Shan neng yan shuo san sheng fa. Shan neng yan shuo. San Sheng Fa, Wu Liang San Mei Yi Nian De, Wu Liang San Mei Yi Nian De, So Jian Zhu Fo Yi Ru Shi, So Jian Zhu Fo Yi Ru Shi. Most who abide on this stage serve as king of the three realms. Most who abide on this stage serve as king of three realms. They can teach the Dharma of the three vehicles. They can teach the Dharma of the three vehicles. They attain infinitely many samadhis in one thought. They attain infinitely so many samadhis in one thought. And the Buddhas who appear are the same way. And the Buddhas who appear are the same way. Okay. The, uh, each of the 10 stages has a conclusion, a summary section. There's some boilerplate. There are some patterns that return. And last week we learned that the, the 10 stage Bodhisattva uh, appears as Maheshvara a lot. Maheshvara. We had a long conversation here uh, among our lay community about is is Maheshvara different than Chakra Indra? Chakra Indra Devana? Is, is how different is Maheshvara from the king of the god of the sixth desire heaven? Hmm. Who is who? Mara. Oh, boy. Here you go. If uh, I just bet this one has been written on, but we've, I should get a stock list of potential master's degree thesis topics that I rent out to people. I'd be wealthy if I had done that early on and set a price on prize-winning master's degree thesis 
topics. Uh, this one would be a hot one, right? What is the relationship between Mara, who is the king of the sixth desire realm heaven, and Satan, of all the names of the devil, Satan is the one in the book of Job, right? What's the relationship? Write it up. Give me a credit in your dissertation or your thesis. Okay, how does that go again? Try me again. So if you look at the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, we call it in the Methodist Christian world, in the Hebrew scriptures, Satan is the devil. Yo, well, there's a story in the book of Job, J-O-B, it's Job, spelled like Jobs, Steve Jobs, but it's pronounced Job, the book of Job, where Satan comes and talks to God and talks about his most uh, faithful, sincere, loyal disciple, Job tests his fidelity, his faith. And man, it's reading, writing, <laughs> studying that book as literature, you come up with a very cruel bargain. Is There seems to be a some sort of mm, perverse joy at testing the faith. Job gets dragged through tests of his faith that you wouldn't want to experience. Ah, awful stuff happens, right? And why does, first of all, why does God take up the bet with Satan in any case? Like, what's the deal? Why? Where's the value there? Just Job is faithful. Let him be, you know? So anyway, later, Satan falls and is no longer in heaven. He's somewhere else, right? Of the hills. So it's like, what a story. What an incredible, incredible legend that is contained in this history of the Israelites that is the Hebrew scriptures, right? Okay. Similarly, in Buddhist mythology, Buddhist legend, in the way the Buddha describes cosmology, the way heaven and earth is built. There is, there are six levels of heaven in the desire realm. And the sixth one is called Ta Hua Zi Zai Tian in, in Chinese. It's the, the, the realm of heaven where living beings, Zi Zai, their happiness gets stolen by others. Others' happiness is hua, transformed, stolen. And who does it? It's Mara, the killer. Mara means murderer. It's the Mo Wang, the king of the demons, right? That's where, where Mara lives. And Mara figures prominently in the story of Prince Siddhartha Gautama, who gets tested by this very same demon just before he becomes a Buddha. And yep, that's the one, that's the devil, that's the demon king. And he is up there at the top of the heavens, same as in the Hebrews stories. So it's like, oh, comparative mythology, there you are. How interesting, right? Is it real? You know, what are the, how come in the Middle East, in the Holy Land, and in India, where these stories first emerged of the Buddha, where our historical Buddha is set, they both have a demon king up in the top of the heavens. And to think, where are we going to look for the devil? Up? No, usually it's down, right? Oh, uh, nope, it's up. But then they fall. And what? So, okay, you get the point. Fascinating comparative mythology happening here old, old stories. 
and they haven't gone anywhere. But right beneath the surface of Christianity and Judaism is this level, this layer of legends about the king of evil. And they say that the, the, the demon king was key to helping Prince Siddhartha become a Buddha. If it wasn't for that Buddhas are accomplished through the aid of the devil. Mo shi mo zhen dao, zhen dao cai you mo, mo de zhen guang liang, guang liang geng yao mo, mo de ru qiu yue, kong zhong zhao chun mo, chun mo ji tui liao, xian chu zi xing fu. Got that? So in that poem, there's lots of mo, and that poem is fun because it's taking the 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 taking advantage of a pun of a homonym more means to rub to polish more is the same word for demon so more and more you polish so more shim more zhen dao demons polish the true dao the true path uh more shim more zhen dao zhen dao cai you mo you can only find the true path with the polishing of the demons more the ru chou uh, more the ru chou ye Let's see, more than more zhen dao, more than more than zheng wang liang. The demons polish the aspirant, the cultivator, till he's truly bright, truly shiny. And the shinier you are, the more you need polishing. Okay, got that so far? Demons polish the true path. Only when the path is true do the demons arise. You don't meet the demon unless you're a threat to him. Okay, you're about to become a Buddha. And he polishes, he tests you, and he tests you till you really shine because all your darkness is, all the ignorance has been polished away. Guang Liang Gong Yang Mo. The brighter you get, the more you need to be polished. Mo de Ru Chou Yue. You get polished until you shine like the autumn moon hanging there in the sky. Kong Zhong Zhao Chun Mo. And that bright, shiny autumn moon illuminates, lights up all the darkness of the demons. Right now, they can't stand your light. When all the many demons are illuminated, are shine, shown up for what they are, they retreat. And what appears next is the Buddha of your own inherent nature. Okay, so most of these who abide on this stage serve as king of the three realms. The Buddha is truly. The, and the Bodhisattva on the 10th stage, likewise, are truly the bosses of the desire realm, the form realm, the formless realm. The Yu Jie, the Si Jie, and the Wu Si Jie, all these levels of humanity and heavens, right? The hells, animals, hells, ghosts, animals, humans, Asuras, Devas, then the Brahma realm and the formless realm. The Buddha is the boss of those three. They can teach the Dharma of the three vehicles. The Bodhisattvas here are now able to not only teach us, we humans who are a little bit awake and a lot covered over, a little bit liberated and a lot imprisoned by ourselves, right? A little bit liberated and a lot obstructed, that's us. But they can also teach sages beyond the six spoke turning wheel. They can teach arhats how to be arhats. They can teach Pracheka Buddhas, how to be Pracheka Buddhas, and they can teach Bodhisattvas how to be Bodhisattvas, all the way up to Buddhahood, the single vehicle. Right? So these are, uh, Shurfu in his commentary to this passage said, everybody has their own potentials, just the way uh, if you look by my by my uh, cabin where I live here, my house, there is a, a tea tree, tree, tea oil tree, a tea tree. There are uh, beautiful bohemia trees right there. And uh, there is a jacaranda tree right over my porch. And this jacaranda tree has smooth bark. It's nice. The birds like it. They like to, the, the branches are just the right angle. So the turkeys go hot footing up the tree. 
kookaburras land in it and the kurwongs. And, um, the thing about the jacaranda tree is that at the right time in September, these incredible purple blossoms come out. And you can, you can spot it from a mile away because there's this brilliant purple blossoming tree covered with purple blossoms. You have to walk on them for the next couple months and they're, they're really uh, messy. They scatter everywhere, but they're the, uh, the brilliance of these purple flowers is just spectacular. And the rest of the year is just a smooth bark tree that drops a lot of branches, right? But it has this potential to, to be spectacularly beautiful for a couple months every year. And that's the potential of that jacaranda tree. And uh, the people are the same. You know, some of us have this potential for certain kind of, of purity, uh, true nobility. Others have incredible generosity and they only live to serve. And they do it so beautifully, so moving. Right? Other people have deep, deep insight nothing fools them they can see right through the surface to the heart of what's really going on in every situation and other people are just uh, all heart they're there to to nurture to hug to include to embrace right all these different potentials of people there's dharma for each of those beings the bodhisattva knows how to teach each one to bring out that quality and then go beyond it to round it out, to bring out all the qualities from each nature. That's the Bodhisattva's ability now. And the Buddhas, let's see, they can attain infinitely many samadhis in a single thought. How does that work? Um, Shurfu in his commentary to this passage said, uh, they no longer have to suo yi, right? Suo yi. They don't have to make, a, a, make up their mind to enter samadhi, which is how um, early stage bodhisattvas have to do. And of course, arhats and meditators on down. They can, uh, arhats and meditators and, and uh, earlier stage bodhisattvas can enter amazing samadhis, but they have to, you know, sit still, have to focus, gradually settle. Anybody who's done mindfulness, you know, how you get you get out of your car or you've driven to where you're practicing and you remember to lock the door, put your key in your purse or your pocket and go in and take off your shoes and say hi to everybody and maybe sign the guest book and sit down and adjust your seat and you know and get it just right and, and uh, uh, see who you're sitting next to and kind of then gradually relax and exhale and then count your breath for a while and then kind of find your inner circulation maybe pick up your mantra everything is, you know right and gradually approach samadhi in that way think of it as a, a practice of of meditation and then ding and you, oh, you slowly come back open your eyes stretch you know come back bodhisattvas aren't that way anymore in a single thought they don't have to so eat. They don't have to prepare and calculate and reckon and all of that. They can, with the movement of a thought, they're in infinitely many samadhis. That's the difference in what? Refinement of your mind. Refining your mind. How are you doing with your ability to subdue anger? transform anger when it rises. When you feel it rise, can you catch it and choose not to? I have a hard time. I have a hard time. It's a struggle to not get angry. When I feel it rise, ugh, feel injustice. For me, when I see people mistreating animals, yesterday in Sydney, people were throwing things at police horses. Um, people in Sydney yesterday rebelled against being told to wear masks. And People abuse the horses. And I see this, I get an uh, irrational, right? Not rational, it's not a choice. It's like, ah, that fire rises up and I want to reach out. And right at that point, to be able to let go, ah, 
that's my energy, that's my potential samadhi, but it's, you know, what do they say? Uh, uh, how, how does it go? Zheng shi sheng fu xin yu dao xiang wei bei, dian sheng si xiang xin yu he de san mei. Fighting is an attitude of victory and defeat. It stands in opposition to the way. Furthermore, it creates the four mark, four hallmark mind. Where will your samadhi come from? Right? So fighting this sense of, I want to stop that person. Right? As soon as you do that, your samadhi is gone. Because there's a me, there's a self, there's an others, there's a right, there's a wrong, there's a living beings and a lifespan. So, boy, that's hard. Look at the bodhisattva. Doesn't even have to think about it and can enter samadhi so easily. That's because he or she practiced at home. What's home? Where the anger rises. They practiced. They practiced. Anger arose and they could. They could shout at their family members, their mother, their siblings, their spouse. They could shout. But then at a certain point, they go, how did I feel after I did that? How did that make me feel? Maybe I could do something different this time, right? And they take, take on the challenge. It's no judgment. It's just your choice. Do you want to use that energy towards cultivation or do you want to use it towards what? The opposite of cultivation, just letting it, I guess, nature, right? Flow along with sheng si. That's birth and death right there. Letting that energy flow out without any check, right? So I brought that up because why? What a difference between me and the real bodhisattva whose mind he has, she has owned her energy. It's hers and it's his. And so she can recycle, repurpose that energy towards awakening. She can still get angry if she chooses, but she, she compares how she felt before and she wants to, to wake up instead of fall on the wheel again. Falling on the wheel, shouting at your family doesn't, doesn't do it anymore. Doesn't get you what you want. You want something different now. So choice we make. And the Buddhas who appear are the same way. Uh, that's more boilerplate, right? The, uh, the Buddhas, uh, bodhisattvas in each of the stages can see increasingly more Buddhas. Just they just appear to them. That was one of the features of the first stage. Buddhas appear, second, third, fourth, up to tenth, more Buddhas appear. Okay, here we go. Moving right along here. All good. Oh, do we need a uh, let's do just a little if you don't mind can you indulge me here for just a sec this is guanyin bodhisattva week at city of ten thousand buddhas and around the dharma realm and i launched a new guanyin song the other week and uh the only way that people will discover if they like it or not is if they hear it more so if you don't mind and I would like to, you know, it's okay to sing along. It's okay. I want to encourage you all to try singing along. The melody is very familiar. It's another Christian hymn. Um, glory, glory, hallelujah. When I lay my burden down. Uh, I, I enjoy the version done by Mississippi John Hurt. But this is, we can borrow, we can borrow that melody. Here we go. to hear the 
worth a thousand hands to help me, you say. My friends have no fear. You can do it. Do you no harm? That's what they say. Sing along. It'll do you no harm. They'll always come to save me from the troubles that I'm in. With a thousand eyes to see me and a thousand ears to hear. to help me one surely draws me Maybe uh, you will always come to save us from the troubles that we're in. Let's see. Let's try that. You'll always come to save us. Oh, us from the troubles that we're in. It's a little bit, little bit bigger, right? Let's see if we can. We'll try that next time. You will always come to save us. This is a work in progress, don't you know? So any feedback or suggestions, improvements would be most appreciated. Okay, you will always come to save us from the troubles that we're in. Okay, there we go. Troubles that we're in. All right. Palate cleanser, back to the sutra. Heading to the 10 magic mountains. Oh, man. Okay, we're going to chant this verse right here. Ready? Sudi Ro Yu Guang Shu Hu Ke Jin Lu Shi Zhu Di Fo Zhi Zhong Lu Shi Zhu Di Fo Zhi Zhong Ru Shi Shan Wang Yi Ran Zhu Ru Shi Shan Wang Yi Ran Zhu Now I have presented a summary of this stage. Now I have presented a summary of this stage. Were I to speak in detail, I could never finish. Were I to speak in detail, I could never finish. All stages such as these within the Buddha's knowledge. All stages such as these within the Buddha's knowledge are like 10 kings of mountains majestically abiding. Are like 10 kings of mountains majestically abiding. So um, I'm going to take a little detour here. Um, when I uh, studied Old Testament with Father Michael Guinan at the uh, Franciscan School of Theology at the Graduate Theological Union, FST, one of the joys uh, of the school that I picked is a consortium. It's UC Berkeley's seminary next door. And there were nine member schools. 
And at the doctoral level where I joined, you could take courses from each of the nine seminaries. For the Catholic side, Roman Catholic side, there were the Franciscan school, the Dominican school, and the Jesuit school. There were three choices of Catholics, Catholicism, Jesuits, Franciscans, Dominicans, very different approach to religion. From the, uh, there was the American Baptists, uh, ABSW, American Baptist School of the West. Then from the, and there was also, some people would say, whether they're Christian or not, there was the Star King School of the Ministry, which is the Universalist Unitarian, the UU school. Even the Unitarians, not the UUs, but the U's, the Unitarians don't acknowledge the Universalist Unitarians. So internal squabbles. But there's also the Episcopalians, the, uh, there are the Presbyterians, and then there are the United Church of Christ, followed by Lutherans. Not Lutherans might have led. So Lutherans, Episcopalians, Presbyterians, and the UCC, which includes the Methodists. So all these different schools all together, the nine member schools, and I could take classes from any of them. What an incredible place to go to school if you want to learn theology. Right? So then there were, beyond that, there were 11 program units beyond that, so different divisions. I made the most of my opportunity to be part of the Graduate Theological Union. It took me 10 years to finish my doctorate because I was also director of a monastery at the same time. But um, the, the, some of the uh, classes that I enjoyed the most were at the Franciscan School. Oh my goodness, what wealth, learning from the friars. The, OFM, Order of Friars Minor. Oh my gosh. Uh, just incredible faculties there. And Father Michael Guinan was one of their uh, frontline, foremost teachers of the Old Testament, Hebrew scriptures, right? And the thing about Father Michael was he had command of multiple Bible languages. He could read two or three kinds of Greek, never mind Latin. He could read Aramaic and he could read, uh, what else? There, he had some other biblical languages. So Greek, Latin, Aramaic. Uh, and I took his class twice. I repeated it because I enjoyed it so much. And what I learned from Father Michael was um, when you have a sacred text, you got a scripture, we have sutras, right? We are looking back through history. That's a, these are very old books. They're at the uh, foundations of our civilization. Certainly in Europe, if you look at Europe, the Bible was the sole source of knowledge for centuries. If you read anything, what you read was the Bible. It was, first of all, who had time to read? If you were busy planting food to eat. Um, so very few people had a chance to go to school or get any kind of education whatsoever. If you got an education, where did you get the education? You got the education largely at the hands of religious people, right? Priests, nuns, monks. And what did they teach? They taught from the Bible. So sacred knowledge and knowledge per se were the same, right? You had to study from the Bible. That's, that's what you learned. And so all of your learning had was came through that lens of uh, words spoken by the prophets, words given from God to, to Moses, and etc. Now, if you want a model for how that could be, look at Islam right now. In large parts of the world, um, the only access that, that children who don't come from wealthy families have is through madrasas, right? Through uh, learning how to read, you learn the, the examples on the board are from the Quran, from the Holy Quran. So that same model is being used now to educate children around the world. They, they learn 
their letters through a biblical lens, right? Through the Quran. Well, that's how education was done throughout history. Turns out when you go to China, that when poor, poor kids, uh, kids who weren't in the 0.05% of the population of China who could afford to go to school, who could afford to get lean up from the, the Daotian, from the paddy field where they were planting their rice or the wheat, uh, those folks often, if you weren't in that elite minority that had could afford tutors, you went to a village monastery school. Uh, this is, mind you, after Buddhism arrived in China. But for a long time, the ABCs, the, the Bopo Mofo, the Hanzi that you learned, you learned from the monks and nuns. Okay, so what's the point here? Here I am learning from Father Michael Guinan and looking back, and he said, we're looking back through history. We're looking uh, through a kind of a narrow tube at a book that came into being and has not changed for hundreds and hundreds or thousands of years. We are seeing a living fossil that came into its current state through a period of centuries. Don't see it as a, a teacup. This thing is here, it exists in this form forever and forever, this is it, amen. He said, the teacup that you're looking at was once clay. The clay came out of the earth. The earth itself is in transition, right? So don't think that the sutra you're looking at, the Bible, the, the scripture you're, you're holding in your hands has always been that form. It is a collage. And then Father Michael would take his languages and look at the Old Testament and say, okay, he says, here's, here's a page. On this page, he says, there are 1,000 years of history. <laughs> here are three, this piece in here, this is Co Koenine Greek. This piece here, this is a Latin, this preceded after a council. They changed all the, and they, they cut and pasted. He said, this here, this is pure Hebrew. Uh, that was the, the missing language. Father, uh, Father Michael also read Hebrew, right? So he said, there's hundreds of, hundreds of years on this one page. And they say it's just the, the voice of God through his jade teeth and his, his golden tongue. He said, yeah, tell me another one. He would say, Father Michael was really irreverent. He would say, wake up, look at, you know, smell the coffee. This is, this is a historical document. All right. So that's the way many scriptures come into being. They are revelations given, they purport to be God's voice given to prophets who then capture the meaning, right? Uh, Father Michael was there to say, sorry, he says, that's just historically not the case. I can show you according to the language that these are four different languages on a single page. Through the whole book, there are all these different additions, cutting and pasting, adding and subtracting. It's a living thing. It's a living document. And so he said, it's, that's because they all purport to be revealed from the word of God to his, through his prophet to the people. He says, well, my experience is different. Okay, you choose, right? So we, he was shaking up all the people who had come through his class, uh, assuming that, that Holy Writ was unchanging and forever. You know, every word is God's truth. Well, he says, not the case. Not the case, it's a historical document. Now, what's different about Buddhist scriptures? What's different about the sutras is They were spoken by the Buddha and kept oral, orally, in oral tradition, down through councils of the earliest monks saying, if we don't write this down, we're going to forget what the Buddha said. The Buddha was a human being. We, we know his dates. 
he was definitely alive. He wasn't up in heaven. He was here on the earth. And he spoke and he insisted that the words he taught were to be kept oral, not written down. Once they're written down, they fall into that, oh, who has the latest copy? Uh, they're, in our, they're in our library. They're not for you, right? Buddha said, Dharma is there for people to use to wake up. It's medicine. It's meant to be uh, in people's hands, right? Don't, give, don't create a priest caste who owns the sutras. It's not. This is, you know, this is a, com a public domain. This is creative commons. Everyone can own it, right? So at some point they wrote it down just so they would have a record. And many of the Buddha sutras are not in contention to say he never said these, right? So the challenge comes when they get translated and certainly some of the documents themselves were eaten by bugs or burned by fire or ruined by water or lost in, an, in a lands in a lands or in a, 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 a earthquake or in uh, if you go out to Xinjiang province to Dunhuang the sands blow in and a, a sandstorm covers over a monastery overnight so you lose all the resources and then somebody digs them up later right so physically the sutras themselves can be damaged but the source of the sutra the awakened mind of a human is unchanging and so not by revelation but by inner discovery by uncovering the sutras in the mind the source is intact and so through translation from the awakened beings in the past we have a pretty good chance of saying to ourselves this is what the buddha meant right this, these these words may have been spoken by the buddha this morning right or tonight so an attitude towards these texts is a different attitude than uh what we uh uh, what we heard from, what I heard from Father Michael Guinan telling us about the historical collage that is revealed scripture. So I had a chance. I sat down with Father Michael, said, uh, you know, Father Michael, the Buddha's, the provenance of the Buddha's texts are different to the way the tradition tells us. What do you say? What do you think? And he said, I love the classical languages of Buddhology. I love Sanskrit. He says, if I had another life, I would continue. I would devote myself to learning Sanskrit, to learning uh, Pali. He said, I love ancient languages. I would love to learn Chinese, he said. And you know what else? He said, I really believe that you can meditate to a quiet mind, he says, and I, I think there's a lot to discover there. So he was a Roman Catholic, Franciscan friar, and he wasn't going to say, you know, your Buddha sutras are true, but the pursuit of the knowledge is true. And the source, that was the difference, was looking within for the source of the texts, not out to revelation. So that was, you know, daring of Father Michael. And of course, the Franciscans love to be irreverent. They're, they're always the, the uh, gadflies, right? So they're, they're no stranger to, uh, to being uh, controversial, right? They love that. So uh, here's our, the reason why I told that story now uh, and was, what pops up next in our sutra is something totally unexpected. Something totally unusual is here. Uh, the story of the 10 mountains, the 10 kings of mountains. What? Yeah. Why? Well, because that's what Vajra Treasury Bodhisattva wants us to 
know about the 10 stages is each of the 10 stages can be understood if we understand 10 holy mountains, 10 sacred mountains, sacred space, right? Okay, so like Ali pushes us right into research, we have to go dig up what are the 10 mountains. So I presented a summary of the stage. I'm done, says Vajra Treasury. If I were to try to give you all the details, we couldn't, we couldn't. Time would run out. We wouldn't be done. There's too much to talk about because it's it's a flow. It's like a river. You can't catch all the river water because as soon as you catch this stuff, more has gone by. All stages as such as these within the Buddha's knowledge are like 10 kings of mountains majestically abiding. Right? He says, yep, there are, there's an analogy for what these 10 stages are, and there are 10 kings of mountains, 10 mountain kings. Shi Shan Wang. All right, you ready? You all ready for some mountain lore, mountain dharma? Here we go. Chu di yi ye bu ke jin. Chu di yi ye bu ke jin. Pi ru xue shan qi zhong yao. Pi ru xue shan qi zhong yao. Er di Jewen Ru Xiang Shan Bardi Jewen Ru Xiang Shan San Ru Bi To Fa Miao Hua San Ru Bi To Fa Miao Hua The first stages, actions and skills are endless. The first stages, actions and skills are endless. The way that snowy mountain holds multitudes of herbs. The way that snowy mountain holds multitudes of herbs. Stage two's precepts and learning are like fragrance mountain. Stage two's precepts and learning are like fragrance mountain. Three is like Vaidari's making wondrous blooms. Three is like Vaidari's making wondrous blooms. All right, three, uh, this is, there's a bunch of unusual names coming at you now. So I'm gonna pop up my research here and here we go, there it is. You ready? Let's take a peek at the 10 sacred mountains mentioned in the Avatamsaka Sutra's 10 stages chapter, holy mackerel. So um, I'll, this is in Chinese. I haven't translated it. I'll just translate it now so we can, we can figure out what it's saying. So the 10 kings of mountains, there are uh, 10 mountains that live in fragrant water. They, live, they come out of the oceans. They're taller than ordinary mountains. And they, they um, so they're tall and they get the name of 10 kings of mountains. This is an analogy for the cultivation of the 10 bodhisattva stages. Just the way um, the bodhisattvas come out of the ocean of the Buddha's wisdom beyond the two vehicles, peaks, arhats, prachaka buddhas. According to the Avatamsaka Sutra's uh, commentary, of Master Chengguan, Master Qingliang, number 44, these 10 mountain kings are also analogies for uh, Bao Wang, kings of jewels or treasures. Okay, number one, we heard about number one just now. Sanskrit name is Himalaya, Giri Raja. So Giri Raja is Shanmong. Himalaya is Xueshan, the Himalayas, okay? Did you know that Himalaya means snowy mountains, mountains of snow? So the snow mountain king. Um, what about it? These are the qualities. There are medicinal plants on, in the Himalayas. People, people tell me that when you go, let's say, <coughs> popular thing is to go on a trek to... Mount Everest, 
Mount Everest is the tallest, right? Tallest mountain in the world, 23,000 feet, is that right? And uh, um, there, never mind the current situation, the current situation is uh, it's become kind of touristy thing in a way to pay a lot of money and get carted up by the Sherpas to top Mount Everest. And there's dead bodies along the road that die there and nobody can take them back down for various reasons stuff. So all kinds of stories. Plus there's a lot of trash from trips that have gone up and didn't carry out their, their refuse, right? Uh, there are a lot of issues currently about Mount Everest. However, um, it is the physically the tallest mountain. People tell me who go up that they're shocked to discover that trekking through Nepal on the way to base camp of Mount Everest, they find these lush tropical valleys. You think of snowy mountains, it's gotta be cold, snowy, icy, right? It is up at the top, but before you get to base camp, you go through greenery, go through trees and bushes and plants and herbs, exotic stuff and wildlife, right? So yeah, it's true that you wouldn't think that there are medicinal plants that grow on the way to the Himalayas. They're in the valleys, you know, there's a valley and a mountain and a valley and a mountain, right? So the valleys have lots of medicinal herbs. These herbs can cure the many illnesses. There's an infinite amount of them. Similar to the first stage bodhisattva, the stage of happiness, his sages, wisdom, dharma herbs. Okay. So the bodhisattva on the first stage, which is called the stage of happiness, has uh, dharma medicine that is wise and it's the way the sage the, the wisdom of a sage so and it's infinite you can never run out of it there's no end to it once you break through ignorance you surpass all the previous practices that you've done the 10 faiths the 10 stages of faith the 10 levels of the abodes the 10 practices the 10 transferences, you go beyond all of those bodhisattvas levels and skills and practices when you get to the Huan Shi Di, the stage of happiness. Um, what about the Huan Shi Di? We learned vows. The bodhisattva there makes all these incredible vows because he can see, he can see where he's been and that you're on the 10 stages. You're the first stage bodhisattva. Wow, incredible what you can see from that level. So, the talk here is of medicinal herbs and um, currently a uh, place where you think about ginseng, right? Renshan, ginseng is one of those herbs that grows in the mountains. And uh, Korea, is a place where those uh, where ginseng, red ginseng, gaolishan, gaolishan is called Korean ginseng. However, Korea shares a border with Manchuria and with Northeast China. And when uh, Master Hua was uh, still a boy in Manchuria, he learned all of the lore of ginseng. There it's called the uh, uh, Changbai Shan, the, the tall, long, white mountains. And ginseng grows there. Ginseng is this amazing plant, they say, can prolong your life. If you're about to die and you have the right kind of uh, Ren Shan Wang, you have the, the royal ginseng. And if you have the right, if you have affinities with that ginseng, if you're supposed to die, you won't die. It's got, it has such an incredible restorative uh, nature to this plant. It's a medicine, right? 
it looks, if you get a real Jinsung root, uh, this is uh, of uh, red Gali Shen, it looks like a person. Its roots go down like legs and it comes up and you can see a head and a body. And Shrifa would tell stories that is common knowledge in these mountains of Korea and Manchuria, Russia in that area. Common knowledge among the folks who go out and hunt for ginseng that the plant can move. It will pick itself up out of the ground, find a better spot with more nutrition and plant itself down again. So how frustrating if you try to find it, ginseng hunters go out at night to find the real, you know, an old wise ginseng root. And what do they do? They say the real powerful ginseng shines, has bioluminescence. Bioluminescence, the plant shines, it radiates light, they say. Okay, you with me so far, still there? So the plant sh sh sheds, like how you know some people's watches have radiant luminous numbers and hands, okay? Well, ginseng puts out that, a natural living plant puts out that luminescence. So hunters go out at night in the woods, in the dark, and they see over there in the mountain, they see something glowing, right? What do they do? They take an arrow with a red ribbon tied to the arrow and they go in the dark, sending the red ribbon arrow out to where they saw the bioluminescence coming from. The plant is shining, right? Then come back the next morning and look for the arrow. And often the ginseng plant will have picked up and tried to hot foot it as fast as a ginseng plant can hot foot away to save itself from being found. And if the hunters are lucky and they have affinity with that root, they will find the ginseng root. And oh man, it was well known that if you found one of those, you know, 12 inch ginseng root and you got the whole thing, uh, that you, your future was made if you could successfully get it off the mountain and out of the hands of the other ginseng hunters who would kill you to get that root, just like gold miners, more valuable than gold. Gold miners finding the gold in the ground in the 49ers, right, in California mountains and Sierras, finding it is one thing, getting it down to San Francisco or Sacramento and cashing it in is something else entirely because you had to run the gauntlet of all the banditos who were trying to take it from you. So the ginseng hunter grabs a root puts it in his clothing somewhere and tries to get down to the capital because if they can get it safely to the governor or the magistrate or the bailiff uh, or the emperor, they can make a lot of money. They can even come out of poverty and into uh, nobility because they found a powerful ginseng root. It's that valuable. Kings would fight for that ginseng root because it was thought to be the, uh, the uh, what do they say? Uh, the agada, the, the heal all herb. It would uh, help you not die. How about that? So that's the story. Now, this is very different, different. No, this is mountains. This is mountain talk, right? Mountain stories. In the snowy mountains, that's where herbs come from. Um, I remember uh, with companions, uh, 1989, traveling to Umeishan, right? Uh, Umeishan is one of the four holy mountains of Buddhism in China. And my goodness, have I got a bunch of holy mountains for you all. Wait just a minute, coming right up. So there we were, we were doing a pilgrimage to Sida Mingshan in China, the Four Holy Mountains. And out in Sichuan province, 
Umeshan, uh, Ume is the mountain where Shen Pusa, Samantha Bhadra Bodhisattva, is supposed to uh, hold court. And this is the sacred mountain devoted to Samantha Bhadra. And we uh, were bowing, we, we got to a place called Jinding Go Peak. And we wanted to bow up to one Nian Si, 10,000 year monastery. We decided at the parking lot, we're going to San Dui Bai, we're going to bow up. And so we started, and it's three steps on bow. There's a bunch of us monks, nuns, and lay women, laymen, lay women. And so we bowed up. And because we were going so slowly, you know, one, two, three, from the parking lot where you can approach Huan Yan Si, there's big steps, big steps, deep steps cut into the mountain so the pilgrims could go up. And the steps are so broad that people can set up their tanzu, people can set up their vending stalls along the road going up, uh, going up to the top to Wanyansu. And uh, the things we saw being sold in the, the stalls along the way, I had never, ever, ever seen before. There are herb vendors selling their wares on the holy mountain that they have harvested from Mount Ume and other mountains in the, on the region in Sichuan. Sichuan is legendary for having the biggest produce, right? Melons are bigger there than anywhere else. Cabbages are bigger there than anywhere else, right? Tomatoes and squash and just everything is bigger and more exotic because it's such lush, incredible mountains right next to the Tibetan plateau there, right? So my goodness, the vendors were selling, I remember the bats, they had <laughs> bats, they were all dried and spread out with their wings and they had caught animals that I'd never seen or heard of before. And just these uh, stalks of dried herbs that if you were uh, a Chinese doctor, if you were an herbalist, you would go, oh, look at that. Oh, hush, oh I want some of that. Oh, look at that. There's uh, some uh, uh, gans hao. Oh, I want that gans hao. And there's licorice and there's uh, hose hair blackener and there's uh, pori cocos mushrooms and, you know, ah, yeah. so, so much stuff was for sale uniquely in these vendors' stalls on Umeshan. As we bowed by, I had to really work to keep my eyes from bow down and look and bow and look, and, you know, because she whiz, uh, things that you may not get back to Umeshan in a lifetime. So indeed, indeed, mountains are where medicinal herbs come from. And currently, I will say my friends who are Chinese herbalists are very, very concerned because as climate change is making the glaciers disappear, the herbs are going away too. And traditional Chinese medicine, in fact, Western medicine depends on these herbs. So much of Western medicine is synthesized out of the natural products of high altitude mountains. Those mountains and the, the fertility of the herbs that come from them depend upon what? Depend upon cold temperatures and moisture and clouds and dew and clean winds blowing through, right? When the temperatures uh, are out of whack, when um, the glaciers melt, those plants will not bloom, they won't grow. So there are, there's a crisis right now among Chinese doctors, herbalist doctors worldwide, not just China, uh, that depended upon these herbs for as long as humanity has been eating the produce, the, the plant world plant world is suffering now from climate change. As they say, anthropogenic climate change, human caused climate change. And uh, those herbs are gone. We won't have medicine. That's a crisis. That's a problem, right? So, 
it says there these the herbs chujir wujin. There's endless quantities. Well, not now. Yong The one thing that won't go away, however, is the herbs of the Bodhisattva's wisdom. Okay. I've got another another uh, tall, high mountain, tall mountain story. We have uh, good friends in Taiwan who um, took us up to the, uh, the mountains where Taiwanese oolong is produced. In this cup, I have some dongding oolong, frozen peak oolong. And we have some, uh, this, uh, our friends have classmates who um, they went to high school with who retired. Uh, here is a, here's a Chinese herb. This is a oolong tea leaf from my thermos. This is oolong tea. There we go. This is, can you see it? There it is. This is a uh, Chinese herb right here. It's oolong tea. And it's semi-fermented, beautiful example. So um, their classmates, instead of going to Taipei or Taichung or Kaohsiung to get rich, they followed their parents into the tea industry, uh, tea production. And we had a chance to visit and uh, went up, 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 up to the top of these mountains next to, this is in the center of Taiwan, in the Zhongbu, next to National Park where there will never be industry, where there's no pollution, where the only people who live are the local Shandiren, the indigenous tribes who live there. And they, uh, the, the tea plants uh, that they grow there have above them is only uh, clear, clean rain, bright sun, clouds most of the year, and the conditions that have existed there purely without pollution, without human intervention, as long as the planet has been there. So it's beautiful conditions, perfect conditions, above an elevation of, what is it, is it 5,000 feet there or 6,000 feet? And the tea that comes from these, uh, from these fields is just the finest tea. And uh, the, the whole family uh, goes out regularly probably every week, and goes out and they take our ye yixin, two leaves and one heart, one stem, and they snap it off and put it in a basket, snap it off and put it in a basket. And they have done this for so long that all of family, you can tell their, their forearms, down there's this muscle, it goes like this. Their, their forearms have this shape, kind of like a baseball player's, right? They develop the muscles from going like this, going like this taking off the two leaves and the stem, uh, then putting it in the basket and then taking it home and uh, doing their special secret peyangfa, their secret method for producing tea from the leaves. And of course, the whole region is full of families like this, but the Zhang family said, this, ours is the best, this is a secret, we never reveal it, my grandfather or my grandfather, his grandfather, down to me, I'm never going to reveal it. And I say it with a chuckle because, yeah, everybody's tea is the best, the best. However, they did say that among the three Zhang brothers who all decided to stay together after the military, they decided they were going to grow tea. This is what they were going to do because they had this legacy from their ancestors. Of the three brothers, the second brother's wife was acknowledged to be the best tea producer. It was the, what is it, Arsal, right? She was the, the wife of brother number two was the one who really understood how to do it just right. And they could taste the difference in her, the tea that she produced <laughs> using the secret method that they all, you know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I could, you know, it's wonderful tea. I couldn't taste oh, the oldest brother's wife, the, only, the, the oldest brother himself. I didn't know. I was privileged, what a treat to be able to taste this tea. Um, 
So mountains, plants that grow high in the mountains. Wow. What are we going to do when the mountains no longer produce Gao Shan Cha, high mountain Wulong Ti? Take a look. Sacred mountains. Here's the list. Ready? Oops. Got to make it bigger here. That make it bigger. No. Okay. Adams Peak, Sri Lanka, Ankh, the Sami people, Norway, Arunachala, India, the Black Hills of North Dakota, Birkin Kaldung, Mongolia, the Kehalao Massif in Toaka, Krogpatrick, Kropatrick, Mayo, Ireland, Dakpashiri, Ume Shan, China, Jabal Nur, Pakistan, Jabal Tower, that's in uh, where Muhammad. Uh, and his companion hid from Qureshi during the migration to Medina. Montserrat, I've been there. Barcelona. Mount Athos, Greece. Mount Akras, Zaphon. Mount Akun in Ubkia. Mount Ararat. Yep, that's in Armenia. That's where Noah's Ark landed, right? Mount Carmel in the Holy Land. Mount Damavand. Mount Everest, we know Mount Everest. Mount Fuji, Fujisan in Japan. Mount Gerizim. Uh, Mount Graham, Huashan, Huangshan, holy mountains in China. Mount Aloha is in Hawaii. Machu Picchu is um, sacred to the Incas in, in Peru, or where is that? Mount Ariat in the Philippines. Mount Baranao, Mount Kailash, sacred mountain. Ajahn Sumedho has done the pilgrimage around that, nearly died. Mount Kenya in Kenya. Mount Kilimanjaro, right, in Africa. Mount Kinabalu, where is that? That is in Malaysia, it's in Sabah, Kinabalu. Mount San Cristobal in the Philippines, Mount Diwali in the Philippines, Mount Lao, is that Vietnam? Mount Lantoy in the Philippines, well, Philippines had lots of sacred mountains. Mount Makilan, Murud, Olives, Mount of Olives in the Holy Land, uh, Nam Kulin, Mount Sakhan, Mount Ecclesia, Mount Tacoma, Mount Rainier, right? Uh, Mount Shasta in Northern California. Mount Sinai, where Moses got the scrolls from God. Mount Zion, the same. Sulayaman, Sulaiman Mountain. Nanda Devi, sacred to the Hindus. Taishan in China. Tiedi in the Canary Islands. Temple Mount, Uluru, the red heart of Australia. Mount Vesuvius and Udangshan in China. This is a current list of sacred mountains from... Uh, Wikipedia, but my goodness, people worldwide have mountains which are sacred space. We look up. It's supposed to be closer to heaven than where we are down here in the Smoky Valley, right? But every people, we love our mountains, and we're, they're considered a place higher than usual, something special and sacred. So next week, uh, we're going to continue looking at the the uh, the next nine holy mountains, the Shanwan, the kings of mountains, and I have stories to tell about uh, mountain experiences that I've had as a monk, and uh, share some of those, more of those with you next week. Okay, this is the concluding images of the ten stages chapter. More to come next week. Uh, Jin Chuan, Jin Wei Shi, do you want to share with us any news from the Berkeley Monastery? Sure. Through the website. The first thing is there's a blood drive coming up. Um, people would like to join in. They, you can visit our local synagogue. It says in congregation, I don't know how to say that. Netavot Shalom. Netavot Shalom, yeah. Um, on Tuesday, August 10th, from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. So please click the link there for to schedule an appointment. Uh, we've been supporting this blood drive for a number of years, and you can say it's a nice way for religions to get come together to uh, share blood, practice generosity, rather than shed blood. Yeah, it's not coming up. It's too slow here. 
So, right. Um, there we go. Back to home, the home button. Yeah, there. Okay. So we go down. So the race by drive. We will also have our dedication of merit um, for the pandemic uh, with a great compassion mantra tomorrow morning from 6 to 6.45 a.m. That's because there's the City 10,000 Buddhas is hosting a Guan Yin session that will begin at 7 a.m. So if people want to join that, um, I believe if you probably went to the CDB USA website, you probably find a link. Um, where, let's see now, where is that? Is that available on the website? Oh, that's probably uh, Hold on. You go to cdbusa.org, it's there. Uh, I know it's in drba.org. Oh, really? They put it there too? Yeah, there it is. Right there. Summer Guanyin session. Yeah. Perfect. So definitely encourage people to join that if you have the time. Um, other than that, we have our regular Buddha Hall activities. Reverend Hongshur just shared at the Three Steps One Bow for India. Oops, and oops, oops. Let's see now. Hold on. Oh, oh, I want home. To the I home one. Hold the home. The home one. The W with the home. Say again? The, you click the, this tab the with the W again. home. Oh, because yeah. it's a, oh, a, yeah, that's a, that's it's a Weebly a, home. Weebly. Scroll down. Okay. Then the Greek, then there was a three sets one bow. We just finished that. Mm -hmm. um, I think we'll post the, the recording. Some people have asked for that. Great. And then if you scroll down, um, DRBU applications, if you want to join for next year, this year we're probably already finished. Um, and then there's a number of archive things like the alchemy of bowing with an inter uh, service space, um, uh, awaken interview with Reverend Hong Shur, awaken call, and otherwise our regular BBM online schedule, okay. which you'll see. Right. Did you click the link? Yeah, there you go. So, yep, that's it. All right. Lovely. <coughs> All righty. Uh, the Olympics have begun. Um, the COVID cases are spiking everywhere worldwide. It's, uh, there's a, apparently what I heard was there are more variants on the way. There's a gamma variant being talked about already. So um, all I can say is please get vaccinated. Um, the only sure way to head off the incredible, um, seemingly nasty consciousness of this virus. I mean, talk about a, an adversary, an enemy, this virus is winning, right? Uh, every attempt we make to, to stop it, it seems to be able to get around. So the only sure solution is to acknowledge, I think one of the hardest things is to acknowledge that somebody might know more about it than you do. Somebody might know more than I do. They might be better informed, smarter. And sometimes it's, it's just the very best thing you can do is just swallow your opinion and take someone else's advice. So if we can acknowledge that, that's a good thing, right? Pride is a sin in so many of the world's religions. So take the advice of somebody who might know more than you do. Save your life, save your life, save the life of your family and friends and go get that vaccine. I've got my second shot this week and uh, it didn't hurt. It was a little brief kind of peak, you know? If, if you burn your tongue on a cup of coffee that's too hot, that hurts more than the, uh, than the, the needle. And I didn't have a particularly awful reaction. And I feel so much better knowing that I will not be the cause of someone else getting sick. Now, because I've got my my vaccine, so yeah, let's let's think it over and see if we can't uh, step up to this virus. It's beating us right now, and 
the way to, to win is to get everybody vaccinated. So sooner the better. Okay. Meanwhile, uh, what we can do is ask Medicine Buddha's mantra to help us uh, balance things that are unbalanced, repair things that are broken, heal things that are ill. That's what the mantra does. So. Here's an image of Buddhas we can bow to. Make three bows. Here's an image of our teacher and founder, Shangshen Xiaohua Wang Yongchuan. Bow in respect to the Venerable Master. Thanks for joining everyone. See you next week for more of the 10 Magic Mountains. Omitofo.